Hey everyone, thanks for joining us for our second official webinar for the My Power Hope Route Riders. My name is Sean Hygen and I am the one that's going to guide you through your training and final prep for the Hope Route. A couple of housekeeping items that I like to just go over before the start of every webinar is asking questions. I have uh, everyone on mute just to make the sound quality as as good as possible for the webinar. So if you have a question, feel free to use the chat box. I have it open in a separate monitor, so I'm keeping an eye on it. Feel free to ask questions at any time during the webinar. The second thing is we are recording. So for those of our My Power writers who can't join us at this scheduled time, they have the ability to watch it at any time at their convenience. And if there was something that you want to go back and watch again, maybe they didn't get it quite quite the first time, it'll be on YouTube, so the link uh, I'll send the link as soon as we're done so everybody has access to it. Outline of what we're going to go over today. I realized last time I didn't tell you anything about myself, so I'm going to tell you a little bit about why I'm the one teaching these webinars and sending you so many emails. Uh, we're going to go over a brief overview of cycling analytics. We're going to look at determining FTP either through historical data, previous rides that you've uploaded, or doing the 20-minute power test and how to calculate your estimated FTP from that and then how to set your training zones as well. And the last thing that I thought I would go over is pacing yourself on long climbs, especially after multiple hard days in the saddle. I know all of you guys have that coming up and you're probably wondering how the heck do I use power to determine what level of effort I put out on these on these long climbs coming up in the Hope Route. So we're going to go over that and hopefully Give yourself a little peace of mind knowing that you have this great tool that's going to show you how to pace yourself on climbs. Okay, a little a bio about myself. How did I become a power expert? Well, I was an early adopter of power. I've been training with it for about 15 years. I've done everything from use it myself through, through training and racing. Uh, I've been a full-time coach of 30 athletes at a time, specializing in training with power I had an indoor cycling center in 2003 that had a 10-person compu trainer system. And I also, you know, what led me to, to become an early adopter of, of training with power? Well, I had a, a significant injury. I broke my right hip in 1998. Lots of complications. I ended up going up to the Mayo Clinic, went through their chronic pain program, and was off the bike for a couple of years. When I was able to get back on the bike, I could only do it for about 15 minutes at a time due to the pain and, and just my fatigue level. Uh, I would get worn out really, really quickly. I did have the ability to suffer though. Being a chronic pain patient teaches you how to, how to deal with pain at a, at a pretty high level. So I had that going for me because we all know that cycling is a sport of suffering. So I can check that one off the box. But when I got a second chance to get back on the bike, I also had this laser-like focus Sometimes when you get a second chance at something, you just realize, like, hey, i got to make the most of it. So I decided I was going to do that. And I also sensed that, you know, this, this might not last forever. I might be on borrowed time. So I, I didn't have any fear of failure. I had already lost it once, and I had gotten it back. So I was just going to go for it. But because I, could, I was in so much pain, and I was so unfit, and, and I had really limited training time, so what I needed to do was make the most out of literally every second and every watt that I had on the bike, which led me to create these incredibly specific workouts. And I would, I was craving data. I, at the end of each interval that I would do on these workouts, I would, I would set up my trainer next to a bookshelf, and I had a, a piece of paper there, and I would just start scribbling all the data that I could remember. So this was before the head unit age, right? We couldn't upload anything. I couldn't record anything. I didn't have a trainer that recorded power, but it was up to me to remember everything. So I would try to remember average power, um, you know, peak power, cadence, speed, heart rate, gearing, the gradient that I had set the trainer at, the length of the interval, everything that I could possibly record using a pen and paper, I did. So what I ended up with was, you know, a couple of three ring binders of, um, you know, dried sweaty pages of workouts, but I accumulated so much data and so much knowledge about these workouts that it was really amazing. And I was, I was able to dial in and adjust my training going forward because of all this historical data that I had. Well, word got out in our little community and, and pretty soon people were asking me to come and work out and, with me in my basement and do these, these workouts. 
So the next thing I knew, I had a waiting list to get in my basement, which was, was just crazy. So we decided, hey, maybe there's something to this. My husband and myself and another partner rented a space, opened up what was probably one of the first indoor cycling centers in the United States. I, I think I know of, of two other ones uh, across the whole country. So a 10-person compu trainer system. I set up all the curriculum. I trained any other instructors that we had. So again, just really grasping for data and knowledge and using it to take out the fluff of workouts, you know, really focus on the quality and progression versus quantity of time. So that then led me to, you know, get into coaching and I ended up getting a job at Training Peaks, which is a software application for uh, tracking, analyzing and planning workouts. I was in their education department. And then Verve contacted me and said, hey, we want you to be the training and education manager for us. So here I am, and that's why I'm leading these webinars. Hopefully that gives you a little bit of background about myself. I am really excited that so many of you are already uploading to Cycling Analytics, and you've emailed me with questions and comments, and you're giving me information about yourself. I, it, it's just super exciting that uh, everybody's on board with this too. So what I thought I'd go over first was the overview of Cycling Analytics, since that is the program that we will be using. I think you can all see it on my screen here. In the upper right-hand corner is the menu tab. If you look at the little person icon, this is a really helpful place where you can change profile settings, password. Many of you have Strava accounts, so you can link them with Cycling Analytics. It'll give you instructions on how to do that here. I've already done that. You can also strip data from uh, Strava if you want to. So if you don't want people to see your power data or anything like that, you can. You can also import rides from Strava. So even if you haven't been training with power, but you've been doing rides, either just using a GPS or using a heart rate monitor, I strongly suggest importing uh, uh, as many rides as you can into Cycling Analytics because the more data that we have, the better we'll be able to predict the future and, and use it for planning and pacing and all those types of things. So it'll give me an idea of your experience and, and current fitness level. So if you have time to do that, great. The last thing I like to go over is privacy settings. If you do ride from your house and you don't want the GPS coordinates available, you can add in that location. There's a couple of sections of questions up above. Given a link to your profile, what, if you want to change the, the link on your profile to make it private, you can. I don't have any problem with that, but I do prefer that you keep the link to rides open because chances are we're going to be sharing some of those links uh, during the HOT route and leading up to the HOT route on any specific training settings. So I'd like to be able to show the public rides, but I don't necessarily need to be able to show them your, your power profile or your metrics history. The next item you see on mine is coaching. I have a coaching account. You won't see this. The next tab for you should be athlete, and this is where the important personal metrics are that I've been talking about in the last webinar and several emails from me. Data is awesome, but data is only awesome if the personal metrics that you provide are accurate. Otherwise, it's, it's worthless. So what's, what's the point of all this? So I really need everybody to go in and at least put in a weight. I don't care if it's in pounds or kilograms, whatever works for you. If you know your functional threshold power, if you know your functional, if you know your maximum and resting heart rate, go ahead and put those in. If you don't, we're going to figure it out shortly. So if you want to enter in your weight, you basically just click on it, add new weight measurement, save it. If you've made a mistake, click on something that you previously entered. You can either delete it or you can edit it and save it. Same thing goes for power. Some of you have told me, hey, I'm working with a coach or I've been, I'm a longtime user of power and I have my FTP dialed. I don't really have a field test on the horizon before the, the HOTE route, so i just like to enter it in. By all means, that's fine. I don't want anybody to change any program that they, any, any workouts that they have prescribed for themselves leading up to the event. If, you, if you've got a good plan and you're on track, just upload, just put, just enter in your FTP and your weight and, and we'll be good to go. The next tab is analysis. I like to think of this as generally trends over time. So there is a calendar feature that we'll look at next, and this analysis is looking kind of at the big picture. You can look at your training load. That's something we're going to dive into deeper next week. You can look at your time and zones. You can even make custom charts if you want to. And 
one of the favorite charts of cycling analytics is the power curve. Now this is the old version. If you see on the bottom, there's a hy hyperlink to try out the new power curve chart. I always like the new power curve chart. I think it's a little bit more customizable and prettier colors, to be quite honest. You can add curves if you like. The default values that come up are all time, this year, this month, and this week. Sometimes what I'll add when I'm looking at my athletes and I know they've done a workout today, I'll add a curve and you see that it gets out of the bottom and I'll click on day. I know myself I haven't done anything today, so it doesn't really matter. But you can definitely customize these. I think you can even change the colors if you want to. But the power curve chart, this is very, very useful in looking at first it'll show you your peak powers over time, the year, all time, the week, the month, etc or even a day. But this is where you can really clue into setting your FTP if you've uploaded historical data or you want to use a previous ride file. You can do it by either looking at the 20 minute power or if you know that you've put in a good solid one hour effort, uh, you would do it here. We are going to look at that in depth when we get into setting your FTP and setting zones, but just know that the power curve peak powers over time. The last tab on cycling analytics is rides. You could also call this a calendar. There is a lot of information that you can get at a glance from this view. A lot of times people will just use it to get to and, and analyze specific workouts. You've noticed here that I've uploaded rides since 2011. When I hover over the year, it tells me how many rides. When I hover over the month, how many rides have been uploaded for that month. Another thing that shows me is the monthly total. So in July, I did 21, almost 22 hours. I did 227 miles, and I had a training load of 1,484. The weeks are also shaded, the summaries. You see summary information for the weeks here. The lighter the shade, the easier week. The harder the shade, the harder the week. The more total, the, the higher training load, or the more intense that, that the training week was on you. So you notice here in June, I probably had some of my biggest or hardest weeks that I'll have likely all year. Whenever you upload a power file or a heart rate file, it also puts on a little rainbow grid at the bottom of the ride. A lot of people don't realize what this is. It's actually your time in zones for that ride. So you can quickly look and see, this looks like a pretty steady state ride to me. It was 62 miles, and you can see the time in zones is pretty well distributed evenly. If you look at the day before, it has a huge green section. That means there was the most amount of time in zone one, a much easier ride uh, in, if you're just looking in terms of zones. So lots of summary information. This is also where you'll upload rides. You just click there, how to upload from the Navi2 coach or, or from your Garmin. If you want to look at a specific ride and dive in a little bit deeper, You'll notice that the little, when you hover over a day in the calendar and you've uploaded a power file, a little charts icon comes up and you can go directly to that ride. So let's look at something pretty recent for me. July 25th, we'll click on the chart. It'll take me exact, straight to that ride. Important to note here, the little down arrow. If you want to edit data, crop ride, download or delete it, it's all in the down arrow. Summary chart pops up, total time, duration, moving time. If you notice that there's a little question mark by some metrics, that either gives you a little bit more information about that metric or it tells you how it's calculated. So you might see some things here that you've never seen before, such as uh, work, which is kilojoules, left-right balance, and that is left-right balance. So 52 is my left side and 48 is my right, just like you are on your bike looking down at your legs, left-right. Something called torque effectiveness, and torque effectiveness and pedal smoothness, we're going to get into a little bit later on in the session. But for now, just know that your info crank records it. Truth be told, there's not a whole lot of research on these metrics. It's, it's coming up. It's becoming more and more popular. The first thing we have to be able to do is actually get and provide the data correct. So that's what info crank does. We're giving the data. The sports scientists and the sports physiologists will ultimately do the research and say, hey, this is what we've determined is the optimum percentage for those numbers. Right now, the jury's still out, and there's, there's some philosophies. Well, the jury's out on a lot of things about training, but 
the first step is to be able to provide the data. Right now, what I, I use these for, quite honestly, with my athletes, is it, it, it clues me into if something's going on. If there's a huge imbalance or the numbers suddenly change, the first thing we look at is, something, did something happen with your position? Is your saddle crooked? Did your cleat slip? Do you have an injury? Do you have a muscle, muscle imbalance? So those are the things I'm looking at right now. And then later on, determining what are the optimum numbers for that athlete. Scrolling a little bit farther down, you just see the general speed, power, cadence stats. Again, effective power. All right, what is effective power? Well, it's like average power, but it takes into account the, the variability of the ride. You know, how much was it going up and down? Were there attacks or surges, or was it a steady state ride? So this number is telling you if we, if, if cycling analytics could take this ride and make it a perfectly, and you could tell you to go out and do a perfectly steady state ride, based on the variability, we think that this rider could have averaged 139 watts versus the 120 watts because of the surgery. So the, the intensity is how hard the ride was, effective power divided by FTP, variability, how smooth or variable the ride is. So this is effective power minus average power. So a ride at a constant output would have zero variability, likely a flat time trial versus a criterion that's going to be up, down, up, down, up, down. That would be a much higher variable effort. Training load, this is the physiological toll that the workout has taken on you. This is something we're going to cover next week too, and we'll cover it with effective power. Basically how taxing was the ride. It's really, uh, this is where you can use individual rides to then look at trends over time. What is, what is your chronic training load? What's your training load average been over the last six weeks? What's it been over the last week? Those are the types of things we'll discuss next week. Here's your time in zones, the breakdown. And it, if you hover over it, it tells you what those numbers actually are. Of course, there's a map. Here's a graph of the ride. You can search for efforts if you want to see a particular hard section. So, for example, if I wanted to see, did I have any sections that were 10 minutes long that I averaged at least 150 watts? Oh, I think it did 10 seconds. Let's clear that. Let's go 10 minutes. There was one. Okay. Hmm, I wonder where it happened. Well, if I click on, on the segment, it highlights it in the graph. It gives me all of the stats right away. It also shows me where I did it on the map, so I can actually see at what place during the ride did I put out this effort. And if I had efforts that were, this happens to be, I think, exactly 150 watts. If I had 10-minute section where I went over 150 watts, it would give me that number as well. So it would say, yes, you know, at this section of the ride, you averaged 170 watts. This wasn't a particularly hard, um, intense ride for me. So I was pretty much just doing a lot of endurance work. As you can see here, there's quite a bit of time in zones one, two, and three. The last thing is the power curve. This is similar to the other power curve, except it shows today automatically. Uh, again, the defaults are all time this year, this month, this week, and today. So by seeing this, you can see the green ride is today. Didn't really do anything that came close to any all time or even this month type of efforts until I get out to, you know, maybe to the, to the two hour mark, maybe this week or this month. Any questions on the power curve chart? There are some other charts here. You can look at force versus cadence. This is similar to quadrant analysis. If you've used training peaks or WKO or Golden Cheetah in the past, basically it, it splits the ride up into quadrants. Uh, this one being low watts, low cadence. And then we have low cadence, high watts. We have high cadence, high watts and high cadence, low watts. So you can see the majority of my ride was pretty good cadence, but not a ton of watts. Not surprising there from looking at the graph and looking at my 10-minute my peak of 150 watts as well. Histograms just kind of breaks down the ride, whether you want to look at power or cadence. Then power versus left, right. This is power balance. It's showing the left leg power balance. So if I am generating the lower watts, you can see that 
it's a little heavier on my left leg as I even out, as I as I put out more power, my power balance actually tends to even out as well. This is this is pretty common in what we see with a lot of athletes. When you're just kind of noodling or tooling around, you let the weaker leg go to sleep a little bit and you don't think about it. And when you get on the gas, you're actually concentrating on putting out power. So the power numbers tend to even out because you engage that that weaker leg purposely. And then if you want to take a look at torque effectiveness, same thing. You can see left, right, and the difference between the two pedal smoothness. So if you see on torque effectiveness, definitely my left leg is a little bit better than my right leg. The left is is red. If you just want to look at blue, and then want to overlay them. Again, we're going to explore these more in detail next week. Okay, let's talk about field tests. The first one is, what if you've got previous ride data that you want to use or you have a previous field test that was that was fairly recent that you'd like to use? Let's do it. So I know that Melanie Beal, the first thing I want to do, she's like, hey, let's use, I've, I've had some really good races. I also know this from looking at her file. Let's, let's take a look at where my threshold is. I'm going to take a look at her power curve. And I'm going to click on, actually, I'm going to go to the new power chart. Here we have the pretty colors. So the first thing I'm going to take a look at is her 20 minute power. If, if you just click on a, a spot on the graph, usually it brings up a grid of, of the rider uh, down below and it has a link. I'm not sure why that's not working right now. I apologize. It should be. Anyways, I can see her peak 20 minute power was 230 watts. Uh, in May and most recently in July it was at a crit it was 216 watts. Now I know this rider and I know where those power numbers occurred. She is a, a local Colorado rider so she lives at altitude. The May 10th numbers were set at, at close to sea level so they're a little higher than she's normally used to training with so I would be more likely to use a, a 216 crit number. But in looking at this I don't see a huge drop off between her 20 minute and one hour power so let's take a look at her one hour power. And that shows, again, a similar statistic, a little bit higher at sea level and a little bit lower at Wednesday World at, at 202. Now, both of these are race type situations and they're mass start situations. They're not time trials, which means that they're highly variable. So I think if we had looked at, if we look at her effective power, it's going to be quite a bit higher than her average power because it was anything but a steady state effort. So if I look at, let's see here. Bring up that link. So I see here Wednesday Worlds. Oh, that's a two-hour power. Wednesday Worlds on July fifteenth, she had two hundred and three watts. So let's look at her ride. And then we see Wednesday World on the 15th. And you can see here, I said do this and treat it like a race. So if we go down, oh, let's see, we want to look at her, we'll say one hour power. Highlights it on the graph. And here we can see her peak one hour power, average power was 202, but her effective power, again, taking into account uh, how intense the ride was, is 224 watts. So there's a pretty big discrepancy there. So again, what, the, what cycling analytics is telling us is, had it been a perfectly even steady state effort, she could probably average 224 watts instead of the 202, because if we, if we remove the surges and turn it into a time trial. So then at this point, what I do is, is I, I, this is where a little bit of, of personal preference and, and philosophy comes through, but I'm going to split the difference and I'm going to probably set her threshold at 210 watts just because we don't have a flat one hour effort. But I do think she's capable of it. So then I go in under athlete power and there you go. I've set her threshold at 210. Then to set her zones, I set her zones automatically. Usually I just use Coggin zones. 
I know somebody asked if we do sweet spot training or if, if it's, it's possible to list sweet spot. You can change the number of zones and you can change the name of the zones and you can change the percentage. So if you want to reset these in your own account, I'm totally fine with that. If your coach has custom zones or you have custom zones, then you just click update and we can use the zones that, that you're used to using for you. you don't, you're not stuck with Coggin zones. So that goes over how to use previous ride data to set your FTP. What happens if you're brand new to power and you don't have any, any previous rides to upload? One of our My Power riders, he's, he's quite experienced and he's been training hard for the Hope route, but he's been doing all heart rate based training. And we need to get his functional threshold power and we need to set up his zones. So he did go out and do a field test, like I instructed. Uh, the email that I sent, I think everybody should have gotten instructions on how to do it. And he told me that it was lap two. So here we get the summary. Here we get on the map where it was at. I can look at, at Ian's ride data, 20 minutes, 7.2 miles, average speed 21.5, average power 278 watts, average cadence 94 RPM. Awesome job. Another thing that I clue into right away is the average gradient of 0 0.3, basically a flat ride. Left, right power, torque effectiveness, decoupling. That is your heart rate in relation to your power output. A rider is accepted as aerobically fit when they have anything over about 5%. Now this is a little bit shorter of an effort than I would normally use, but I wouldn't expect to see anything different over, over time for, for a rider like Ian. So when you do a one or two hour time trial, one of two things usually happens. Either your heart rate stays the same and your power declines, or your heart rate goes up and your power stays the same. Well, that rate of difference or decoupling between the two is what's said to be your decoupling rate, and you can use that to determine how aerobically fit an athlete is. And once you get to about 5%, they, a lot of people, will, a lot of coaches or, or science, exercise physiologists or scientists will say, okay, you're aerobically fit, it's time to work on other stuff, such as threshold, VO2, neuromuscular power, those types of things. You can get into more specific, more intense training. So then we see he's done the average. I look also at his effective power, 282. It's not a huge difference from the 278. So again, a pretty steady ride, even just seeing on the graph, uh, there's a little bit of terrain changes and stuff, but overall, a very steady effort. So then what I'm going to do is I'm going to take his 20-minute power, 278 watts, and I'm going to multiply it by 95%. Oops, 0.95. And that's going to give me a number of 264. Again, this is where you might want to bounce it off someone like myself or a coach uh, or someone that's experienced with training when you're determining a lot of the information out there will tell you that it's 95% of your 20 minute power. Well, I, I think that's true for fit endurance athletes that have been doing some, some pretty specialized training. If you're new and you haven't been doing a lot of training, you haven't done threshold tests before, you haven't done a 20 minute test before, you don't have a lot of miles on your legs, you might want to go closer to 90%. Uh, depending on the, the athlete that I'm coaching, I use anywhere between 90 and 95% of the 20-minute power. So if you're feeling like maybe 95 is, is a little too high for you, go for 92 or 93. It's always better to start a little bit more conservative. We can always bump it up, up if you're hitting those numbers regularly and you're just not, not getting tired or, or feeling taxed. So err on the side of, of conservative and bump up as needed or shoot me an email and ask me a question. So 264 watts for this rider. Then what we do is we go back to the athlete and we go to power. And there it is. I've already set it for him. 264 watts. If I wanted to add it again, I could put in another one here. Set zones automatically. Update zones and you're done. So that is how to set your threshold power by using a 20-minute field test. So now you have both options, whether you're doing historical data, previous ride or race data, or you're doing the 20 minute test, you should be able to set your FTP confidently. The last thing that I would like to go over is pacing yourself on long climbs, because I know a lot of you have this big ride looming in the not too distant future. And if you're new to power, 
you're wondering how the heck do I use this thing to pace myself properly on these climbs because it really, really is a, a great tool because our mind, we can't always trust it, right? We get excited and we might go too hard and we don't think it's too hard or we might be really tired mentally and that leads us to believe that we're going harder than we actually are. But this info crank power meter can say exactly what you're doing and based on your FTP, you will be able to just dial in an exact power number and be confident that it's the right effort for you. So how do we do that? I'm going to go back and look at myself as an example. So I'll go back to rides. And recently, you can see by the dark colors, I was over in the Alps and doing a lot of riding that I, I normally don't get a chance to do. And even though I'm an experienced rider and I have lots of miles on my legs, I know how to take care of myself, I, I know pretty well how to pace myself, I really didn't do the specific training that I should have been able to leading up to this ride. I'm busy, like most of you or all of you, and work a full-time job, so my training's limited. So I figured I would be a great example of someone who did a, a pretty big block of training, not anything like the Hoat route, but still significantly more than I was used to. I think the biggest ride that I did leading up to this was probably two, two and a half hours. Let's look at, I think the date I want to use is the 23rd. Correct. So you can see I've had almost a, a big week. Yeah, I've had a week of riding. And then we went and did the Stelvio from the long side, the one with the 48 switchbacks. I had never done it before, but definitely wanted to go and tackle this climb. We had done it from the other side the, the previous day. We had done it from the Bormio side. And this is from the Bergisio side. It was the biggest week, like I said, since March. So we know I have fatigue building. But I do have miles and experience. I had set my threshold. My threshold go, prior to going to the Alps was 175 watts. But I'm also coming from elevation. So I knew that I would be able to ride at a slightly higher power output than I could do at home in the Colorado mountains. So I bumped up my FTP from 175 to 180. Pretty conservative number, but I also didn't want to blow myself up. So I did give myself a little bump in that FTP number. Now, how do you determine pacing based, based on FTP? So here's the ride. It's pretty much all up and then downhill and a slow crawl back to the hotel. The first thing that I notice when I look at this file is I start out hard and I gradually fade towards the end. So possibly if I wanted to go back and, and see if I could do better uh, on this type of an effort, I would maybe hold myself back a little bit more and see if I had anything extra at the end where I could really kind of crank it up. If you scroll to the power curve chart, this is, this is where you really look at things. You can see from anywhere from 20 minutes to two hours, I don't really lose a ton of power. So I, I did an okay job of pacing myself at 20 minutes. My peak power was 181 watts. My all time was 186, which was the day before. <laughs> so I was definitely pushing myself uh, while I was over there if I set my peak power of all time. Again, though, I'm coming from, alt uh, from altitude, so generally lower numbers than I would set in Colorado. My one hour power, my best one hour power was 176 watts. Again, the day before, 622. So I'm definitely not holding a whole lot back while I'm over there. But my two hour peak power goes, it goes from one hour at 179 watts to two hours at 164 watts. Hmm. So if we click on the one hour, we go back on the graph, I look at it here, my average cadence is 73 RPM. Left right power, pretty close to, to perfectly balanced. But then let's look and see what happens in the second hour. Well, my power goes from 170 some watts to 148, clearly the decline that I mentioned earlier. So not a great job of pacing myself. The average power was 164. So if we bring out our little calculator again, and I say my threshold, oops, my, if I average 164 for the two hours, and my average threshold is 180, I average 91% of my threshold 
for two hours. Again, I already mentioned that I might pace myself a little bit differently, but the fact that after a week of hard riding in the Alps, I was able to average 91% of my threshold for two hours and set my peak power, you know, numbers the day before, this is this is a really good sign to me. I'm, I'm doing good. I'm handling the training load and I'm handling the, the fatigue pretty well. So what I would recommend people do, depending on your fitness level and your experience level, you're going to pick a number somewhere probably between 80 and 95% of your threshold to hold on the climbs and, and try to hold yourself back to not go over that. Now, this is also dependent on what your goals are for the hold route. If your goal is just to compete and you're, you don't care about a, a finishing place and overall ranking, anything like that, again, go conservative. Go to 75, 80% of your threshold. You won't be wrecked every day. Hold yourself back. Hit that 75, 85, 85%, and not completely wreck yourself. Now, if you're going to win, or you're going to podium, or you're going for the best place possible, I will go closer to that 90, 95% of your threshold. If you've done specific training and you know that that you're as fit as you can be going into this event, you're ready, and and you've done prescribed training for it. 90, 95% would be what I would target for, for the climbs. Where can you make up the most ground on people? It's going uphill. Everybody tends to go downhill pretty fast when you get into a competitive environment. On the flats, you can draft. Um, but climbing is definitely where you can put time into, into your competitors. So, again, it's a big range, 75 to 95%, but depending on what you've done prior to the Hote route and what your goals are for the Hote route, that gives you an idea of which end of the spectrum you're going to be on, whether it's going to be the 75 to 85 or the 85 to 95. And then I would suggest looking, if you have previous ride data, what you've been able to hold in the past. And if you have any other long rides coming up, you know, if you're somebody who doesn't maybe have the first, if you're not doing uh, the Pyrenees, if you're doing the Alps or the Dolomites, you know, go out and see what, See what you can handle on a long climb if you have the ability to do. If you don't have climbs, there's still a way. And that's by using big gear work, possibly on a trainer or into a headwind. You can simulate a long climb. So those are things that you can do to gauge your effort. You know, you might not be able to do a lot of back-to-back -back days because it's getting closer to your event, but you could go out and do something for an hour or two at a lower threshold, right? So don't completely blow yourself up, but go out and try that 75 or 85 percent at threshold, which might might be somewhere around sweet spot for some of you. Just just tapping into it or a tempo type effort and see how it feels and note how it feels. Did it feel easy? You know, were you rested? Think about how you're going to feel when you have multiple days on yourself. I would I would definitely try to get in a couple of efforts at the lower range just so you understand how that feels and how it's felt in the past, you know, what you were able to handle. So hopefully that gives everyone a little bit of information about how to pace yourself on long climbs and long climbs day after day. As always, any questions, hit me with an email, hit me up on Skype. Uh, I appreciate all of you for taking part in this, and I look forward to talking with you guys over the coming weeks and helping you have your best route possible. Thanks again. Take care.